great to be here and thank you for selecting me to give this introductory uh, lecture. So I'm very excited to talk to you about my research, which as Teresa already said, is about renewable power. So I'll, I'll basically talk about two research projects that I have that are looking at the impact of renewables in Spain and Chile. Uh, and first, I will give you a bit of an introduction. So as you may know, we really need to reduce our emissions and we are failing pretty, pretty bad except maybe in the electricity sector where we have done some, some progress. So the electricity sector is considered to be a major uh, sector uh, to fight climate change because it's the one that we actually know how to decarbonize because we have technologies now that have become cheaper and cheaper. Uh, it's very important to decarbonize it as well because it will be the one absorbing many other um, sectors that are contributing to climate change. So if you see in this picture, electricity is kind of a bad guy when it comes to climate change and transport is not a big bad guy. Well, as you might have noticed, transportation is uh, gradually being electrified. So eventually we need to electrify all these sectors and we need to do so with clean energy that does not emit greenhouse gases. There is a lot of consensus again that uh, if a transformation is feasible, is precisely in the electricity sector. So it's a very exciting area to study. I personally studied, I started studying the electricity sector during my thesis at MIT, and I started in 26, 2006, and things were not nearly as exciting. Uh, renewables were pretty ex uh, expensive back then, and people were not as positive. So I do think uh, there is some reasons to be excited. This is actually a pretty old graph because it only goes until 2018. You might be thinking, well, we were kind of born by 2018, so it's not that old. Uh, well, uh, things have changed so dramatically that even just five years ago, uh, renewables had different costs than today. So they just keep getting cheaper and cheaper and basically cheaper than the alternative, which is not necessarily good. This is a, a graph for the United States and natural gas looks cheap. Indeed, natural gas is very cheap in the US, but for Europe, there is no question that the cheapest source of energy today is renewable power. Let it be wind, onshore or offshore now, or solar. So there are some challenges that come with building the, the renewable fleet. One is that renewables are not necessarily where we want them. Um, and one example is offshore wind. I don't think we have villages offshore, or at least not yet. So we need to bring that power into the cities, into the main consumption centers. More generally, we could have good solar power or good wind power in places where we really don't have much of uh, demand. And an example that you will see later is the Atacama Desert, where there's unparalleled solar potential. If anyone studied physics as an undergraduate, there's also unparalleled views of the sky because there's not much in there and no clouds. But on the other hand, there's uh, literally almost no one living there. So we need to bring that power with transmission lines and that's a, a challenge that we are starting to address. Another challenge, oh, I forgot to update this slide. So another challenge that was supposed to be challenge one is that um, um, wind and solar just come whenever they want to. So we cannot decide, oh, now it's going to be uh, daylight again. Uh, it just comes with the natural processes of sun uh, during the day and night. Uh, and then for wind, wind uh, patterns can be predictable, but still quite erratic. This is something that we call intermittency. And at the early stages of renewable power, people were very worried about this intermittency of these um, power plants because they were very different from what we used to do. Traditionally, we had some gas and some coal and we would burn it whenever we wanted to. And now we have this sun and this wind that come, you know, whenever they want to, and we have to do things differently. So these two challenges are the ones that I will talk about in the two papers that I will present. One will be in the desert of Atacama, highlighting how transmission can really untap all these benefits from uh, wind power, sorry, from solar power. And the other one will be in Spain, where I will show that in spite of being very concerned about this wind intermittency, the fact that wind is unpredictable and a bit volatile, Spain has managed to put massive amounts of wind into the grid with little increased costs. You will see that costs did go up a little bit, 
but not that much from intermittency. So um, I also hope that today you will see a bit of a toolbox of how economics can be helpful at providing uh, detailed, uh, methodological, kind of methodic, might be the, best, the better word, analysis of the cost benefits of these technologies. So I'll highlight a lot of the benefits because these will come as net benefits, but I will also highlight what the cost might be and how to trade them off. Um, so here I put a bit of a list of the things that we will consider. So as for costs, obviously we have to pay for these solar panels, we have to pay for these windmills. There are costs to incumbents who uh, usually make it very hard <laughs> because they were used to be the big guy in the room and now they are becoming smaller and smaller. And there are the costs of intermittency that I was mentioning. We need to adapt to this wind and this solar coming in and out. And there are these transmission investments which depending on the location of wind and solar can be quite expensive. So this is kind of on the effort side. On the benefit side, well, these technologies can lead to big price reductions because their costs can be very low. It can also lead to pollution reductions, which are particularly relevant for um, closing down power plants that are next to big cities. So if you manage to close a power plant next to a big city, you can actually have big health impacts uh, to the people living uh, near it. There are greenhouse gas reductions that come with it. This is on fighting climate change. There is potential resilience from these wind and solar panels that don't depend on, let's say, the geopolitics of the world. And there might be some investment spillovers. So for example, as we build more and more transmission, we can have more and more wind and it's a bit of a, or solar, and it's a bit of a virtuous, virtuous cycle. So I'll show you how I quantify them in different uh, papers. I have to say there are many, many papers in economics uh, that are doing this type of quantifications. Some of them are based on regressions. The first paper that I'll show you is a regression-based paper where we take data and we run regressions to see the benefits of wind. And some of them are based on a structural model, detailed models of the grid, of how power plants interact in the market. The second paper that I'll show you will use that kind of a tool. Teresa already uh, mentioned that this is all done thanks to an ERC consolidator grant that I started in 2021 and that it's looking at how to adapt and change uh, electricity markets to basically uh, untap all the renewable potential that we see. So let's jump into case study number one, which is from here, from Spain. So uh, Spain, uh, as you might know, uh, you are there. So it's separated from France from the Pyrenees, with the Pyrenees. So from an electrical point of view, it's a bit isolated from the rest of Europe. During bad times, that might not be necessarily a bad thing. And Spain was a little bit sheltered from all what's going on um, during the Ukraine war and the natural gas crisis. But uh, in general, it's not, not a very good thing to be isolated when you have an electricity market, especially when you have a lot of solar and a lot of wind. So uh, there was a bit of a question of what would be the impact of wind power in Spain, given that it's together with Portugal, an isolated, a pretty isolated system. So what we do in this paper, we take data from 10 years of uh, electricity market data, and we see how the market dealt with days of little wind versus days with a lot of wind. And we try to learn whether the market was having a hard time taking all of this wind, and to which extent it impacted negatively the costs in the system. The kind of the highlight of the paper is that we actually, we take these costs of the system seriously. So we try to take very detailed data on the cost of congestion from having too much wind, on the cost of having reliability problems, needing more backup power just in case wind does not show up. So this is kind of the highlight of the paper. Um, the data we have is from Red Electrica, which is the transmission uh, system operator, the organization in charge of making sure we have light right now, and then Omia, which is the guys running the market, so deciding uh, what's the price and who will be producing what. The data are extremely detailed for those of you in 
the energy masters, you will get a detailed data set from me that you will be able to play with in the winter. Uh, but it has market prices, the cost of intermittency, again, this is quite unique, uh, reliability service, how difficult is it to deal with all of that. And to do the cost benefit, we also have data on how many emissions are being saved, or we estimate how many emissions are being saved, what are the subsidies that this wind farm received, so that we can do a good apples to apples comparison between the cost and the benefits. So um, this is what we will do, and the way we do it is with this detailed hourly data set. Uh, and the approach is very, very simple. Wind is very indulging when it comes to, all of you have done the brush up, right? The econometrics, the statistics brush up. So uh, the, you were saying X is a random variable. That might have sounded a bit like, okay, X is a random variable. Um, well, wind is a random variable. So all of the OLS kind of things that they highlighted, they apply to wind because the wind, wind is as good as random. So when you run a regression, you don't have to worry about all those endogeneity problems, whether you have good instruments, all of those things that you might learn during the year, they don't apply to wind. It's very indulgent. So the approach is very simple. I think you guys could do it. Maybe if I gave you an assignment by tomorrow, we just regress these important outcomes onto wind and we see what an increasing wind is doing to the cost of the system, to the prices in the system, and to emissions. So it's a very, very simple approach with the benefit of, again, wind being random. So we also try IVs because we wanted to publish this, and we had to say we used IVs, but as you can see, whether we use this one, this one is wrong, we know it's wrong, but whether we use this one or this one, we get very, very similar results. Uh, so this is an example of one of the regressions that we run. In this regression, we're asking what are the costs, additional costs to the system of having congestion, reliability problems, needing more backup. And we, could, we confirm what we suspected. Having more wind in the system makes those costs go up. This is why we have this positive effect. So adding one gigawatt hour of wind in the market makes electricity 0.2 euros uh, of megawatt per megawatt more expensive. Now, most of you might not even have heard ever about euros per megawatt hour, so you might not know what 0.2 means, but uh, it's a small number, and that's a big finding of our paper. Yes, wind is making things difficult, but it's making things difficult only a little bit. Some engineers had been forecasting that it would be really difficult and it would make the costs go up by a lot. And instead, we see that they go up, but only a little. We also ask, um, do these costs go up more when we have a lot of wind power? And actually, we don't find uh, that this is the case. So let's see if you can see this little hand. You can, yes. So here we ask days of little wind, medium wind, medium and highest wind. And this is the point two that I was showing you. If you increase wind, the costs go up by point two. We see that if there is little wind, those costs are smaller, which makes a lot of sense. If it's a little wind, it doesn't make much of an effect. But importantly, we don't see these costs blowing up as we put more and more wind into the system. So as we put a lot of wind into the system, these costs remain at point two, which is another key finding of our study, that these costs are small. And the second finding is that they don't blow up as we put more and more wind. So we show in the paper many other things, like the effect on different operational costs, like congestion or uh, reliability. And we do find that this pattern is similar across costs. We also look importantly at what wind did to prices, and the effect here is much stronger. So you can see here the marginal impact of wind on prices, the prices that consumers pay, and you can see that the effect is also two, but not 0.2. So we have that if you increase wind, you increase the cost by about 0.2, but the prices go down by two. So in a sense, yes, you are making it a bit harder, but you are saving a lot of money thanks to it. So armed with these different regressions, we do a cost-benefit analysis. And because these things have very different implications for different players, we do it separately for consumers versus producers. Importantly, for producers, we separate the wind farms, which clearly benefited from these policies, from the other uh, types of producers, mainly coal and gas. And we try to see who are the winners and the losers. This is what we see here. We find that throughout, consumers benefited from wind in net. 
This is not an obvious result because even though the prices went down, consumers had to pay some hefty subsidies for these um, power plants to come online, for these wind farms. And we find that even after paying these hefty subsidies, consumers were better off. Wind farms made a lot of money. Uh, and then um, wind producers and uh, non-wind producers were the ones who suffered the most. These red diamonds show you how the results would have changed if we had ignored all this congestion and all these problems that wind brings. And you can see that, yes, if we ignore these additional costs, wind looks a bit better, but at the end of the day, it doesn't substantially change the picture. So the bottom line is that while wind makes things harder, it doesn't quite affect the cost benefit in a way that would change the main conclusion. To make the cost benefit final assessment, was this a positive or negative for welfare? What we do is try to make different assumptions on how to value emission reductions and how to uh, assess the cost of building the wind farms. So we have different assumptions and we basically find that the policy was successful, but depending on the assumptions, it can have a big range. So depending on the assumptions, it's successful as soon as the carbon tax is $30. But depending on the assumptions, if we make them more conservative, the carbon tax needs to be $130. Uh, In today's uh, context, people believe that carbon taxes should be around $130, $150, even if they are not. So overall, even with very conservative assumptions, the policy seems to be a net positive. Although, again, it depends on what you are willing to assume. So I will talk about the second paper. I told you I would talk about wind in Spain by using regression analysis. And now I'll talk about solar in Chile by using a structural uh, analysis. In the case of Spain, I was talking about the challenge of intermittency. In the case of Chile, I'll talk about the challenge of transmission and how Chile uh, fixed it. So in Chile, there's the Atacama Desert. I already told you it has unparalleled solar potential. So they built a very big line to bring solar power from the Atacama Desert to the north of Chile, where the copper mines are, and to the south of the center of Chile, where Santiago, where Santiago is. We study in this paper with also hourly detailed data. We study the expansions that happened in 2017 and 2019. So you can see here a visual graph of what happened. And basically what happened is that the north was completely separate from the center. And what they did is build a line between them. So this heat map tells you this is expensive, this is quite expensive, and this is dirt cheap. This is the Atacama Desert. There was a lot of energy that had nowhere to go. So as they built the line, they made prices in the mining region very, very cheap. And as they further expanded the line, they also made prices very cheap for Santiago. So this is what we study, and we study it in two ways. First, we just do an event study before and after the transmission was built. And with that, we get the immediate effect of the transmission line when somebody went into the room, a big room, and pressed the button to turn it on. And we find, obviously, very large effects because these are large lines. Additionally, we try to ask, well, there was all this power that was making no money in Atacama, so it was not a very profitable business. But as you build these lines, the business becomes more and more profitable. So we compute what are the benefits to investment, how many more solar plants came into the Atacama desert thanks to these lines, and we find that that effect is even bigger. So this is a summary of the paper in a picture. So if we do the event study, we are basically comparing the Atacama desert, sorry, the prices in Atacama versus other parts of the country before and after. And if we do the before and after without the investment, we would be comparing this line here, outer key, to potentially some trade. What we do with a structural model is also take into account that this expansion also allows for a lot of solar investment. The bottom line from this picture, even if I don't have time to explain it in detail in this uh, summarized class, is that this triangle is smaller than this bigger triangle. And if we want to get at the full picture of the benefits of the transmission line, we need to have a model to account for this uh, solar investment. 
So the first part that we do is the event study that I mentioned, and we basically do also a very simple approach where we regress costs on a dummy variable, a zero one variable for the time at which a given line is built. So this is the first line alpha one, and this is the second line alpha two. In this study, we call it interconnection because the first one connected the north with the rest, and the second one we, we call it reinforcement because it was not a completely new line, it just make, was just making it bigger. So the interconnection and reinforcement, this alpha one and alpha two are giving us the reduction in costs thanks to the line. We find it here. So we find that after the interconnection, cost went down by about 2.4 or $2 per megawatt hour. And with the additional reinforcement, they went down by 1 or by 0.6, depending on the hours of the day. Overall, we see a reduction of uh, 2.6 to 3.3. It's basically about 5 to 10% reduction in costs, thanks to the transmission line. So is this the full effect? Well, in the paper, we argue, well, that's the effect immediately after building the line, but we are not taking into account that many power plants of solar came into before the line because they were expecting the line to be there eventually. So what we do with the structural model, this red line is the solar plants as they are coming in. They came so massively and so rapidly that they were receiving a zero price and only after the line came in, they started making money. So if we do a before and after, we are not uh, taking into account that many of these solar panels came here because of the line. So with a structural model, we try to say, okay, how much of this red line is also thanks to the line so that we can do a more fuller cost-benefit analysis. The structural model, I will not talk about it in enough detail. I don't know how I'm doing on time, how I'm doing on time sort of okay, 10 minutes, okay. So uh, to get at the full effect of the line, again, the event study is only part of the effect. So we will do a, a model of the Chilean electricity market. The guys at Energy will, I am advertising uh, my masters as well. It's a bit unfair, but you guys will learn how to build these models. Uh, so we build a model of Chile. One nice thing about Chile, if you had to highlight a feature, a geographical feature of Chile, I guess it would be that it has very high mountains and also that it's extremely long country and very narrow. So one advantage of Chile is that we can model it from an electricity sense very easily as a single line. The electricity grid gets very complicated as we put many triangles and many hexagons and many kind of complicated lines. But in Chile, we can build a very good model with simple lines. It will be basically a straight line going from uh, the north to uh, the center of Chile. The south is a very long country, so the very south is not connected to the rest of the country. So uh, what we need to build a model is hourly demand, the cost of the different power plants, and importantly, where they are located. Uh, we need the topology of the grid, which again, we can make it very simple. And uh, we also need um, um, emissions numbers and other stuff to do the full quantification. So the good thing about this is that, again, it's a line, so we can easily build a model that then we can change. And basically what we will be doing is make the line bigger or smaller between the regions to see what the impacts are on production as well as investment. So for production, it's a constraint optimization problem that we call it. The Chilean electricity market is minimizing costs depending on whether they have more lines available or less lines available. So this is where the impact of the line will come. And then on the investment side, we basically uh, estimate how much solar power wants to go to Atacama and the north of Chile, depending on whether the lines are there or not. So what we do is an at present value of how much money solar panels are making. And importantly, the money that they can make will very heavily depend on whether the line is there or not. So this is what allows us to say, well, without the line, we would see much, much fewer solar installations and the benefits of the line would be much, much smaller. So this is all the ingredients that go in there. It's kind of a lot, but I more or less already gave you uh, a hint. For those of you in the data, um, 
in the data science uh, courses that might be overrepresented here in the Bella Terra gathering to uh, make the network. We actually use k-means clustering to decide how to come up with these regions. K-means clustering allows us to see which regions go, go together. And it's kind of a nice application of k-means uh, clustering. So um, this will allow us to compute the impact of the line. We also need to know how much it costs. And this we just take from the Chilean government, their documents. It's about $1.8 billion. So we will see if this $1.8 billion was worth it, given what our model is telling us. And in the model, we'll take into account consumer surplus, uh, what solar uh, producers are gaining, as well as what's happening to the traditional ones, as well as the environmental benefits. For this application, we do not need the environmental benefits to justify the investment, but it's obviously a great uh, implication of this development. One thing we are ignoring is the fact that there is now extremely cheap power in Chile. Chile used to be one of the countries with the most expensive electricity. So we are ignoring what I would call secondary, like second indirect effects or kind of trickle down effects of having very cheap electricity. So this is a conservative calculation, I would say, of all the benefits that Chile has had from this very cheap power. So what we find is that the investment effect is very important. So we do one, one where we forget about the effect on investment and one where we account for the effect of investment. And we basically find that um, if we look at the one with investment uh, effects, we find that the line is paid very, very quickly. And we find that it only takes seven years to pay back the line. If you think about the cost benefit, it only takes seven years to pay back the line. Now, transmission lines, I've lived in the US, they can last many, many, many years. They look old, but they can last many, many years. So seven years to pay for a transmission line is a very, very good bargain. We find that if we forget about the investment effects, well, depending on the discount rate, you can still justify the investment, but as a government, it takes a much bigger effort to justify an investment that it would take more than 25 years, uh, to, more than 25 years to pay back. So it's kind of a highlight of why taking into account investment effects is important. It, that it can change the discussion around whether a government could, could or should make uh, such, a big, such a big effort. So uh, um, this is, uh, at the end, a very good success story from Chile and Spain that I presented today. So the Chile one is a very, very big success story because in most other countries, it's super hard to put these transmission lines. People really don't want them there. And there are lots of debates on who's winning and who's losing. The good thing about Chile is that, as I mentioned, there's really not that many people living in Atacama. So everyone was benefiting from taking power out from Atacama and sending it to other places. The ones that could lose from it are the coal power plants. Many of them were in the north. But another good kind of silver lining of the Chile story is that the line was discussed a long, long time ago when renewables still were not that cheap. That coal power plant thought that they would make more money by having that line, so they also supported that effort. So it's kind of a, a, a case in which everyone was happy to do it, even the ones that shoot themselves in the foot, they didn't know they were doing so 10 years ago. So uh, in many other settings, there's been a lot of government attempts of making these transmission lines, and again, some success stories, but in most other countries, it's a much harder uphill battle. In this paper, we are trying to highlight that if you do the numbers right, if you do the economics right, it's a no-brainer, at least for the case of Chile. So this is what I wanted to present. I put here the papers in case you are curious. Some of you will have to read them, whether you are curious or not about them. Uh, so I hope I got you excited about renewable power. I work a lot on climate policy and renewables, it's about the only place where we can be a bit happy. So I hope you're happy about the enormous transformation that we have seen in renewable power. It's a very active area of research. I have a big grant and I still cannot, cannot do everything I want to because it's such a, a great area of research and a, an area that's changing every single day. So um, I'm around, and I hope we will continue talking about these big issues uh, going forward. Thank you again. Hi, uh, my name is Ivana. Um, my question is about this unexpected 
reduction in this price of competitor that the Chilean, the coal plants are facing. And uh, before I've heard something about the when when your competitor decreased prices so much, you're now <coughs> eager to de um, to uh, lower your price too, but like too much in the sense that you know if you're expecting that the renewables are going to get cheaper and cheaper in the future, you're now willing to like sell all the coal right now, and that actually might you know push us um, uh, uh, with the CO2 more than we want by 2050. So I was g wondering like um, what you think about that. Um, so uh, in the case of Chile, Chile is a very, um, they have a lot of copper, but they don't have any energy commodities re readily available in Chile. So in Chile, that's not as big of a pressure because they were buying very expensive coal internationally. Um, I am studying myself also the energy transition in the United States. And there it's a very different picture because there are some coal producing states that have many big areas of the state that are just uh, mining jobs. They know those mining jobs are ending, but they want to try to push a little bit more coal in, especially not maybe as much the coal power plant, but the coal mine that's feeding the coal power plant. And in some research, we are finding that they are underpricing. So they price their coal much cheaper than it should be uh, to to make it into the electricity market and burn some more coal. Uh, it's a difficult question because I see where they are coming from, but obviously it's something that we should try to avoid. So we're trying to see how which regulations can successfully prevent some of that behavior. Uh, but being a bit mindful that those communities are were already very impoverished and are even more um, losing even more jobs now, so so we're trying to to be mindful about it. But still, we need to stop the coal. So we're trying to <laughs> to be forceful at the same time as we're trying not to look like we don't understand what the problem is. Yes, but it is true, and they are precisely doing that there in Chile. Again, it was not um, domestic coal, so the incentives are not as strong. Yes. Um. Yeah, thank you for the uh, presentation. Um, in terms of the global energy transition, as you've mentioned, uh, energy storage and transmission line costs are going to be immense challenges for many economies. To what degree do you think these are technological market dynamic challenges versus political economy challenges? Oh, which are bigger? Um. So on transmission and batteries, we are seeing enormous technological progress. Like, again, it's an area where we are actually seeing progress. Um, so if I had to be pessimistic about something, it would probably be the political economy. Yes, uh, yes, unfortunately. But I do think um, it, is, uh, it is easy to make people afraid of changing things. And that's uh, something that some people know how to exploit. <laughs> uh, so it's often uh, very easy to get enough support to kill a project. It's very easy to get enough support to kill a project, and it's much harder to get enough support to push it forward. Yes, in the US, it's kind of a bit funny because except for some iconic projects that were killed, for example, for pipelines, even the regulation itself, it's way easier to push an oil pipeline than to push a transmission line. They are now trying to change the regulation because otherwise it's impossible to build a transmission line that will cross states. But if you think about, let's say, the wind power that's in Iowa, the, the prices are already zero. They don't know what to do with that wind. And if they don't cross state lines, they don't have anywhere to put that wind. Uh, so they are trying to change the regulation to make it less, less, less difficult to get at that political economy uh, problem. Yes, um, there is in Europe also, I think, uh, um, a growing political economy concern uh, with uh, cheap power and connecting cheap power. For example, Spain has a lot of cheap power, and obviously we want to send to Europe, but some people are saying, well, if we have cheap power, why don't we just manufacture ourselves? So these questions of who's winning, who's losing, will come up more, more and more, I think. Uh, yep. I don't have a background in environmental uh, science, so I, I can't speak intelligently about it, but um, 
I was curious, I, I'd heard some arguments about solar power specifically um, and the potential dangers of implementing too much solar power in, in the sense that it could cause heat terraforming. Um, was there any concern about that in Chile at all? Or, or, and did you see any impact in terms of the investment? So the word you used is heat? Heat terraforming. Uh, essentially, that as you increase, the way I've understood it, as you've increased solar power in a certain location, you may see the environment start to change because of the increased heat in that location. I mean, the Atacama Desert is, is, is an ecosystem, but it wouldn't be a huge ecosystem in the sense that it's already very, very hot. So, um, so I don't know if there are studies of the implications, but there is limited life already in the Atacama Desert. But it, but it obviously should be uh, investigated. Um, I come from a mining area near here, and they wanted to cover an entire mining mountain, kind of a salt mine, mm, a mountain. They wanted to cover square kilometers of uh, solar panels that would be all covered in that thing. That looked a bit dangerous to me, but that was uh, humongous. In Atacama, these are very large installations. It's just there is not a lot of uh, wildlife around and definitely no vegetation, so I don't know. Yes, uh, but in general, um, installations are not nearly as massive as the ones in Atacama. Yes, yeah. yeah. Um, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, I guess the one thing that I would be really interested to hear about is the kind because you, you obviously have your academic work and then your work with policymakers. What kind of evidence really cuts through um, to the policymakers, and and how you found that sort of process of, of <laughs> straddling the two sides so yeah, yeah. It, it's very difficult to be honest so when I'm an academic I'm very prudent on how I make my statements but you if you are that prudent in front of a policymaker they will not listen to you so you have to say uh, your best guess but without too many too many caveats because if you give them one caveat they'll take that caveat and and it will be a problem maybe i'll tell you an anecdote i was working for the california resources board where they were implementing their cap and trade program and they asked my co-author and me an economist at uc berkeley brilliant person canadian this is important remember it so uh, she and I were supposed, to, uh, we had the task to evaluate the subsidies that they were giving to manufacturing plants to compensate part of their carbon tax. So California had put a carbon tax. Well, we couldn't call it a tax. It was a cap and trade program. But uh, the carbon fee, or however we could call it, we had to do many modifications to the report. So that carbon fee was kind of high for some of the manufacturing industries because Nevada and other states could compete with them right away. So they were receiving some subsidies to compensate them for the carbon tax so that they wouldn't be paying all of it. So we were tasked with... Uh, with uh, the duty of laying out a theory of what those subsidies should be and make an assessment of whether the current subsidies were too high or too low. Well, we came up with a theory and then we did some regressions to assess whether they were too high and too low. Now, our report was full of like, well, with this crappy data, what can you do? But let's try to do something with shitty data. You know, like it was so like, my Canadian friend, that was me, my Canadian friend was more like, oh, I'm so sorry that this regression is so bad, but may I say that with these numbers, so we were extremely cautious in our report. We did not know that the California Resources Board were ready to take table two from our report and print it in the proposed uh, legislation for the next iteration of the cap and trade market. So that table two that was filled with like, oh, we're so sorry that these numbers are so terrible, went into a public hearing and they killed it right away. Not only they killed it, but it backfired and they managed to get uh, higher subsidies. Our report was saying that they should be lower. So, um, so yes, uh, since then, I don't put those things in my policy things. I am just like, given the evidence, this is the right path and you have to own it a little bit if you say the... Well, uh, over time, we don't know for sure. So over time, you might be like, oh, I guess I said it wrong. But, but, but you are a bit confident that given your evidence, you were saying what you believed was true at that moment, but being very aware that it might not be true uh, two years later. So yes, uh, yes so that's uh, my, my story, yes. Yeah.